Dobaran. Hello. Um, my name is Paul Hornby. I'm from Vancouver, Canada. I've been to Skopje a number of times before, but I, now I'm based in Spain and I'll be spending a lot more time here, hopefully, as things evolve. Firstly, I'd like to thank Philip Dovtoski, who organized this event, and Maria from the Drug Agency, uh, Ms. Maya Kohek, who lends myself incredible help in organizing these events, and the earlier speakers from this group, Dr. Ethan Russo, uh, uh, Jose Carlos, Dr. Jack from the United States, uh, Zledko from Slovenia, and Javier from Spain or Portugal. Uh, they've been presenting all week. My job is to, to, I guess, to close this event. And I was going to summarize their, their talks, but I, we're short of time, and I know you all want to get on with your Friday afternoon, so I won't take up too much of your time. Uh, incidentally, I had a, another talk uh, organized for this morning where I was to talk about standardization and quality control of cannabis. Um, that's been cut for time limitations, but if anybody has specific questions around standardization and quality control, I'd be happy to talk to you outside after this, this meeting now. Um, and I will be covering a little bit of that in this uh, lecture. Um, this is a really exciting time in history of cannabis medicine. I've been researching it for almost 20 years, and every, every year I think it's going to be legalized and uh, we'll be able to research it the way we want to. And every year goes by and there's just another block in the way. And I'm afraid to say that's government because they don't seem to understand the need for research. and. The profundity of the discovery of what's called the endocannabinoid system. Um, Jose Carlos just spoke of that and he talked about it yesterday. When it's all unraveled, the endocannabinoid system will be considered one of the biggest medical finds of the past century. It's right next to DNA and insulin and its importance to human physiology. I can't emphasize how important this system is because it's a, a balancing homeostatic property of human, not only human physiology, but right down through the animal kingdom, we have endocannabinoid systems balancing nervous systems. And if anybody studies biology, which I'm sure most of the people in this room have, homeostasis is a primary function of biology and is extremely important to life itself. I've been asked to talk about chronic pain today. For all the medical uses of cannabis, as you as medical people will find that most of your prescribing or recommending cannabis will be for pain issues. Um, I had my lab in a dis what we call a dispensary in Vancouver for five years where I witnessed roughly 4,000 people using cannabis therapeutically. And we did a survey on that dispensary and many other surveys have been done on dispensaries in Vancouver. And we find that 70 to 80 percent of the people that come to dispensaries are attempting to manage chronic pain in one way or another. Um, and with chronic pain goes what we call chronic pain syndrome, which is the mood disorders that develop from being in 24-7 pain. You can't tie your shoe, you get angry, you get anxious, you're late for your meeting, you get um, angry at your family and friends, and that causes mood disorder, often depression, anxiety. And as it turns out, cannabis treats these disorders as well. Um, let's move on a bit. Whoop, wrong one. I really like this image because it, this fellow looks like he's in pain. <laughs> and um, 
with the, the mood disorders like, like depression and anxiety, cannabis has an enormous range of efficacy. It will treat many, many illnesses in the des with the desired effect if indeed it's dosed correctly and the correct strain is chosen. Uh, Dr. Russo sp spoke about strain effects, meaning the terpenoids in combination with cannabinoids. We often forget there are flavonoids in cannabis as well, which are receptor active. The take home message of what I want to say today is that single molecule, we often call it silver bullet medicine, is very different in its effect than what, as we as cannabis medicine researchers call the entourage effect. You can liken it to being shot in the face with a 22 pistol as compared to being shot in the face with a shotgun. Um, I don't like, the entourage effect is often the analogy that single molecule medicine is like a 22 bullet and cannabinoids were like a shotgun effect. Um, I, in, looking at that analogy, I actually Google imaged people who had been shot in the face with a 22 as compared to those being shot in the face with a shotgun, and it's way too graphic to show here. Um, but indeed, there is a great difference in effect, and that's what I want to emphasize today that um, single molecule medicine is very different than extract, combination, family. I, I say that THC often works with its brothers and sisters, meaning CBD, CBN, CBG, the other cannabinoids and terpenoids. This is my philosophy. Um, during my doctorate training, they sent me to India for a year where I worked with fishermen on a beach. We were doing studying oral cancer, and my job was to go around, wake up these fishermen that slept on the beach with a translator, look inside of their mouth for precancerous oral lesions because they were all what we call beetle, beetle quid chewers, and they had a very high incidence of mouth cancer. Then I use a special camera to photograph the inside of their mouth, and we were looking for precancerous lesions. And incidentally, at that time, we were trying to prevent this cancer with beta carotene and vitamin A by supplementing a group of people in a quasi-clinical trial we put together. Uh, nevertheless, in India, my thinking from previously being trained in Western pharmacological medicine. Then I go to India and I witness a lot of old people that were slim, they looked healthy, they weren't on heart meds or antidepressants, they were using what we call Ayurvedic medicine or natural herbal medicine. And my, my thinking changed. I, I had always had the opportunity of using high-tech um, analytical equipment so when I came back to Canada, I started applying the equipment in the lab. I'll show you what I mean, these two instruments here, to ancient medicines. And um, I started my research and development company originally around developing, optimizing herbal natural medicines by standardization and quality control. Um, these are the two instruments that are required in every cannabinoid lab. A full cannabinoid lab will have uh, GCMS here and HPLC here. This is the instrument that I know and love the best. I've spent many years on this instrument as well. But this one, you can see all of the cannabinoids. You need GCMS to see terpenoids most of them. Um, but these two instruments in any lab that I'm comfortable because with these um, you can see virtually every molecule known to man. And uh, I, 
I got so much to say, I don't know how I'm going to get it all in here, but um, the point being, well, another thing is these are the instruments we use to standardize and quality control cannabis medicine because with the GCMS you can see pesticides, you can see contaminating solvents, you can't see the micro, we do the micro in a separate microbiolo bi <coughs> microbiological lab where we're looking for things like coliform, um, salmonella, uh, pathogenic bacteria that could be in a prep. And we also look for heavy metals, which can be done with the GCMS or HPLC. Thank you. I'm going to go back to that other slide. Um, natural versus thin, synthetic. Um, welcome to the world of cannabis medicine. As medical people, I'm going to ask you to make a paradigm shift in your thinking. I know that medical doctors like to get a drug with a specific dosage on it. They know exactly how much to recommend to their patient. With cannabis medicine, you're looking at more than a thousand different molecules in a prep, in an extract. How do you predict a dosage from that? To a point on natural versus thin synthetic compounds, vitamin C is often used as an example. Um, my pointer show up there? No. Vitamins, natural vitamin C is a mixture of eight different compounds. Um, there is what they call factor K, factor J, factor P, tyrosinase, which is an enzyme, ascorbinogen, and ascorbic acid make up natural vitamin C. Synthetic ascorbic acid is one molecule, and it's ten to time, around ten times less potent than natural vitamin C. Another common one is sea salt that contains sodium, potassium, magnesium, and other calcium salts that, with, that are refined out of uh, salt that's mined from the ground and put on people's tables for dinner. It doesn't contain it, the potassium, magnesium, other uh, electrolytes have been taken out of that. If a, a marathon runner uses table salt, their muscles will often bind up, they'll become dehydrated, and they won't be able to run. If indeed they use sea salt, uh, they don't experience this effect to that degree. Now, if we're comparing synthetic to natural cannabis, this would be used for pain relief as well. There's a product on the market, I'm not sure if it's available here in Macedonia at this time. It's called dronabinol or marinol. Marinol is synthetic THC. And many patients, I'm just going to read a report here. Many patients report that marijuana has better therapeutic activity than dronabinol and that cannabis has less side effects than, than dronabinol. Dronabinol often causes psychological overdose reaction symptoms such as dysphoria, depersonalization, anxiety, panic reactions, and paranoia. That's an overdose on THC. It's pretty well described. You get anxious, you get muddled, uh, you don't know where you are, and you get paranoid. That's what THC does. Uh, as a synthetic, even more than it would as the combination in an extract. Uh, this is a bit of an aside. There are uh, many administrative routes for cannabis. Incidentally, if you're treating cancer, now, I've spent the last four years primarily in the Balkan countries working with people that are studying mostly epilepsy, but we do cross over into cancer and chronic pain. And we're finding that people, particularly with cancer, are best treated with suppositories, high THC. I'll get into more on dosing uh, later on, but it's an important administrative route for uh, treating cancer. Okay. 
Uh, we call it polypharmacy, the mixture of compounds in cannabis. This is what I call a work of art in chromatography. This was done by a Swiss fellow, uh, Brendanson. Oh, I hope you can see it here. Um, this is the, if you can see along, where I'm, along the bottom here, there's a lot of little peaks, and then you see these big ones. If you're an analyst like myself sitting behind the computer, these, this large THC peak is attenuating out all of these smaller peaks. So with the computer, you can blow up more than 400 peaks that make up this profile here. But you see, you start with the terpenoids and the cannabinoids come out later, they're higher molecular weight. This is done with mass spectroscopy. So with this instrument, you can click on any of these peaks and you get the full mass spectrum of the compound that made it. So it's very confirmatory method for identifying cannabinoids or terpenoids in a mixture. This is to support my point that indeed we can identify and quantify every cannabinoid or terpenoid that is in a, in a medical prep. Um, but we would only standardize it to the amount of THC and CBD and pro probably to, to myrcene, which is the most abundant terpenoid in this prep. And uh, cannabis is all often uh, characterized by the terpene profile because these profiles are like a fingerprint of the strain. It'll be the same time and time again. You know, it was actually Dr. Raphael Mershulam from Israel that was one of the first to suggest that THC by itself had a very different effect than THC with its brothers and sisters in the, in the matrix. And Carlina, Carlini in 1974, this is all early work incidentally, determined that can cannabis produced effects two to four times greater than it, uh, was expected from THC by itself. And similarly, in 1981, um, Fairburn and Pickens detected the presence of unidentified powerful synergists in cannabis extracts, causing 330% greater activity uh, than THC alone. This is what we see time and time again in the field. I'm, a, I'm not a medical doctor, I'm a researcher. I have a doctorate degree in human pathology so I do research, and in the field we see this time and time again, meaning if we're doing small uh, pilot clinical trials where we're dosing people every day with, with uh, known amounts of, of standardized cannabis, and then we switch over to a drug like dronabinol or marinol, or indeed synthetic CBD in cases of epilepsy, and we, we get completely unpredictable results. It's, it's all over the map, and I want to talk a bit about cannabidiol and the bell curve effect that you'll see with synthetic CBD. Um, Dr. Russo touched on it a bit yesterday, but what it is is when CBD, if you give some synthetic CBD to a person, you don't get any effect here. You get an optimal here, you don't get any effect at higher dosages. This is what they, they call the bell curve effect. Um, a friend of mine, Dr. Lou Mirhanush from the Israeli University uh, in Jerusalem, also works in uh, Raphael Meshulam's lab, um, has shown this effect a number of times and has written a, a paper published in 2015 on it. But it means that you have to hit the dosage right at the optimal before you'll see an efficacious effect with pure CBD. Um, and also, <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to confuse you by jumping around, but CBD crosses over not only to um, the CB1, CB2 receptors where it it actually doesn't bind with any kind of affinity. It's, it's sort of a low affinity binder. 
and it's often been looked at as getting in the way of THC, of getting at that receptor. Um, there are some theories here on how CBD affects THC binding at the receptor. You see the, the KI value here at the CB1 is 4350, whereas THC's KI value at the same receptor is around 41. The lower the KI, the, the greater the binding affinity. So CBD does play with the receptor, but it doesn't clamp on in any sort of uh, fast way. The other mechanism is CBD may modulate THC signal transduction by perturbing the fluidity of neuro neuronal membranes. This is an old theory. Um, I believe that both are happening, that CBD will interact with the cell membrane in a nerve cell and affect transmission, but it also will modulate the effects of THC at the receptor. And C may, CBD may remodel G proteins that carry intercellular signals downstream from cannabinoid receptors. Okay, I'm with that. And CBD is a potent inhibitor of cytochrome P453A2 here. Um, this is extremely important. It's been talked about in virtually every lecture this week that CBD, I just mentioned it, has an affinity for cytochrome P453A, which is a subfamily, a very polymorphic, mom and dad can even have different enzymes in the children. Um, it's extremely polymorphic. And bind, that, I guess that's really what's the difference. Everybody's different in how they respond to medicine. In my simple mind, that's because of how you metabolize these drugs. And they're all metabolized. Most pharmaceutical drugs are metabolized by subfamilies 2A and, and or 3A and 2C. So if you're blocking that enzyme, you're not blocking your psychotropic uh, antidepressants or anxiolytics. They can actually go up in the bloodstream and in stream and in the brain and lead to an overdose. Not that we observe this with natural extracts. We, we've cross um, uh, dosed with many pharmaceutical drugs and cannabis extract and never observed an adverse reaction. It's only when we use synthetics that we see these problems. This is uh, quite an important slide that CBD, CBN, and CBG may affect anxiety and depression modulating other neurotransmitters. This is a, a really good paper by John McPartland, um, who is now a naturopath but was a pioneer in cannabis research back in the early 80s, late 70s, and it's an excellent review article I can email to you where he is showing through reviewing studies how uh, pure CBD or synthetic CBD has a very different effect than the entourage. Uh, this is some of the mechanisms that cannabinoids work by. This is a crossover of receptor activation. You've got the serotonin receptor being activated here, a similar mechanism as Prozac. Um, enhanced norep norepinephrine activity, similar to tricyclic antidepressants. Increased dopamine activity, similar to monoamine oxidase inhibitors, and augment GABA like baclofen or benzodiazepines. So, cannabidiol, this is not THC, incidentally, this is CBD and a couple of brothers and sisters. And the receptor active, they're working on more than one receptor system, so you're getting a lot of activity with, with um, brain chemistry from a few different cannabinoid molecules. Oh, I want to show you a little video. Um, it's quite amusing. I hope you can hear it. This is a study done in, in Glasgow University in Scotland in the psychiatry department. And it compares injecting uh, pure THC, which I gather is a synthetic THC, with an extract, meaning all the 
cannabinoids and terpenoids are present, similar to the smoking cannabis. The woman speaking in the video is a little confused on what she's calling skunk, which is a high THC smokable cannabis. And she calls, which she's re when she says cannabinoid, she's referring to the mixture of, of cannabis as opposed to pure THC. Let's just see if this works. But are these views right? Is it really true that the skunk out there can play havoc with your mind? Here at the Institute of Psychiatry, I've agreed to take part in a unique medical trial designed to find out. It's part of their ongoing research into the link between stronger cannabis and psychosis. The scientists are interested in the effects of the ratio between the two main components of cannabis, THC and cannabinoid. So on one day, I'm being injected with pure THC, something like ultra-high potency skunk. On the other day, I get a mixture of THC and cannabinoid, more like the natural makeup of the cannabis plant. When I get the injections, I don't know what I'm getting. It turns out that this one is a mixture of THC and cannabinoid. After 10 minutes, it hits me. This, this is natural cannabis. With the THC and cannabinoid, no matter how hard I try to take the experiment seriously, it all seems hilarious. something a bit softer than that. <laughs> what does it feel like? It looks very enjoyable. My God, it's fun. It was amazing. Amazing. With the pure THC, it's a different story. It's horrible. This is an overdose on pure THC. At a funeral. Worse. It's sort of like, um, it's just so depressing. You'd want to, um, top yourself. Do you know what I mean? It's sort of morbid. After 15 minutes, I begin a series of psychological tests designed to measure whether I've become psychotic, and if so, how severely? I feel agitated. No. On the THC and cannabinoid mixture, I seem really flippant. On this drug, I just don't care. I'm experiencing profound insights. Bollocks. I'm worried state of mind won't end. I don't want it to end. This experience is frightening. Strong. I feel agitated. Yeah. I do. But with the pure THC, I'm suspicious, introverted, weird. Every question seems to have a double meaning. Trouble is, my attention's like really so massively into s s just a word or something. It's like, but not in a happy, it's like in a morbid, morbid. Is, that's how I feel, morbid. It's an anxiety. It's like, an, it's like a panic attack. Do you know what I mean? It's like, uh, you ask me a question, I'm thinking, I don't know the answer. I'm just one of many volunteers taking part in this trial. The doctors are hoping to answer some of the really important questions about cannabis and psychosis. For example, do people react differently to exactly the same dose of THC? And can cannabinoid reduce the psychotic effect of THC? It certainly made me uncontrollably giggly. Um, that hopefully demonstrated the difference between pure THC and natural product or extracted cannabinoids. Uh, an overdose on THC, like I said, won't kill you, but I've often s said too that you'll know you're going to die, but you won't. Um, it can be one of the most frightening experiences you can ever have, an overdose on THC. It's not pleasant, which 
emphasizes the fact that when you're starting, particularly new people out who have no cannabis experience, to start them out at very small dosages. And you're gonna have to monitor them through the first week or two on how they're doing on specific dosages uh, so you can optimize their treatment. Getting more into the other brothers and sisters of natural cannabis, we come to terpenoids. Um, there's more than a hundred of them, actually quite a few more than a hundred. And there's been studies that have shown that uh, these essential oils um, by inhalation are sedative and that this fellow named Boot, uh, Bootbauer in 1993 tested 40 essential oils and found that the most sedative ones come from cannabis, ones like uh, linalool, citronol, and uh, alpha terpenol. Uh, this is where, like Dr. Russo was saying yesterday, what we call couch lock or the feeling that you're extremely tired or sedated comes more from the terpene fraction than from the cannabinoid fraction. Um, more on terpenes. This is actually a, a steam distillation device, a small one where the essential oils are extracted from cannabis. Very low yield, less than 1% often, um, but yet highly effective uh, medically. And they also affect serotonin, norepinephrine, dopamine, GABA receptors as well. And uh, I've been shown to decrease anxiety by attenu attenuating corticotrophin releasing factor and Cortical releasing factor associated with anxiety, cannabinoids uh, once again causing uh, adjusting cortic corticotrophin releasing factor. So the terpenoids are not to be forgotten as being medically active too. To go into cancer a little bit, uh, limonene blocks carcinogenesis, um, detoxifies carcinogens, inhibits isoprenylation uh, of RAS proteins, Limonene induces redifferentiation of cancer cells by enhancing expression of transforming growth factor beta and growth factor two receptors. Limonene induces apoptosis in cancer cells. These are some of the um, suspected mechanisms of, of cancer uh, therapy by cannabis. And not to be forgotten are the flavonoids that also are more present in the leaves than in the flowers. Regardless, cannabis contains spe specific flavonoids and um, specific to the plant that have shown to have anti-cancer, anti-anxiety, antidepressant uh, properties as well. There's one, uh, epigenin is a, is a the active ingredient of chamomile, for example. This is a, a flavonoid, um, another brother and sister of THC and CBD. Um, <laughs> an unwanted side effect of cannabis, um, I would say more smoking it than taking it orally is that it affects short-term memory. Um, the Terpenoids have been shown to increase uh, cerebral blood flow, which will help in memory loss. Uh, alpha and beta pinene have been shown to have similar effects and increased memory. So it really depends on the terpene profile whether you'll experience this type of side effect. Once again, pointing to the role of the different cannabinoids and terpenoids in efficacy and this must be paid attention to. You're gonna to have to get used to looking at different strains of cannabis that will have different profiles and different effects. And data is coming out on that uh, all of the time. Uh, once again, Dr. Russo mentioned ways of characterizing cannabis, saying that the cannabinoid profiles and terpenoid profiles are very specific to any strain of cannabis and there are companies like Leafly and other people putting out what the effects of these profiles will be.
This speaks to the anti-inflammatory effects of CBG, CBN, CB, and C CBD, CBN, CBG, and CBC. Um, they're, they're all anti-inflammatory. Uh, the greatest treatment value of CBD may lie in its multi-target actions of polypharmacology. Pharmacotherapies that target neuro, uh, numerous receptors across neural networks may be more efficacious than those that maximally selected for a single target. This is the importance of the entourage effect. You're affecting much more receptor systems than one silver single bullet molecule. This is the range of cannabis efficacy, everything from ADD to Tourette's syndrome. This is an extremely broad range. I've often said this is why cannabis is illegal, um, because it's so effective in treating so many illnesses. Um, there are, are industries that don't want it around uh, because of, of this kind of efficacy. To get into mechanism of, of uh, pain relief, I'm going to show you another short video. It's less than four minutes, I believe. So if I can get it to come on, maybe not. I like these um, animated videos to help you visualize. not going to work. Um, okay, we'll move on. Um, these are the conventional pain treatment um, medicines, morphine, codeine, hydrocodone, fentanyl, oxycodone, methadone. Um, indeed, they relieve pain. In April, I broke my leg and my elbow in two places. In Spain, I fell off a balcony off the top of a ladder onto concrete. Spent a week in a hospital where the first three days they gave me opiates and the last four I combined uh, high cannabidiol capsules with the opiates where they synergized very nicely. And then the, the latter part and since that time I've only used uh, hemp ex flower extract with um, 50 milligrams of CBD, and a very high content of caryophylline or caryophylline, uh, a terpenoid. And it did all I needed for my pain relief. I mean, I, I'm not using a cane anymore. I can, it was five months ago, but I, I think I made a fairly quick recovery for a 64-year-old. And without trying very hard, and got better and it continues to get better, but the point is all I'm using for pain relief is hemp flower extract. I had asked a friend in Vancouver that I worked with for many years who was in chronic pain to send me x-rays of his metal that he's got in his neck and in his arms and in his spine and in his hip from a fall. and. We call him Metal Man because he holds the record in Canada for having the most metal in his body. And he is in chronic 24-7 pain. When I first met him almost 10 years ago, he was a living dead person. I call it the, the zombie syndrome, where he would stay on the couch all day, ma managing his pain with opiate medications. Um, I had the same effect in my hospital room. I thought I was out going to lots of meetings and traveling, then I'd open my eyes and I'm looking at the same yellow wall again. I was delusional, I couldn't work. When I switched over to the CBD, at least I could do some work. My mind was more clear. Also, as I mentioned, there are really no recorded deaths from overdose of, of cannabis. You'll find a few if you go looking for them, and I guarantee you that if you look deep into those deaths related to cannabis, there's other psychotropic 
antidepressants or anti-anxiety or anti-seizure drugs involved. These drugs here with the asterisks are the most commonly overdosed opiates. Uh, adverse reactions to legally prescribed drugs is the fourth leading cause of death in the United States. According to the American Medical Association, legally prescribed pharmaceuticals kill approximately 106,000 hospitalized patients annually, are responsible for an estimated 198,000 related annual deaths and necessitate 23% of all hospitalizations. Death from herbal remedies is much lesser the FDA received 2,900 adverse reports, including 104 deaths from thousands of herbal supplements. Natural products are apparently safer than synthetic uh, single bullet. That's what killed Dracula, wasn't it? Silver bullet um, medications. Also, they're highly addictive. This is not a, a good image I've got here. I, I just liked it as a seed, but um, opiates are highly addictive. We did a study at a dispensary in Vancouver where we put up a notice that anyone addicted to um, methadone could sign up for a small study. We had people we call methadone liquid handcuffs because the person must show up at the clinic every day to pick up their methadone or else they go into withdrawal. So we had them come, after they went to the clinic, they would come into the dispensary where they'd fill out a questionnaire. This was on a, a two to three time a week basis for all the people we had in the study. And then they'd go away again and come back the next day and answer questions. and. Uh, we tracked their prescription records to methadone. And of the group, we, th th all of them re reduced their methadone consumption by 50% in, in a matter of weeks. We realized quite quickly that the first 50% reduction is the easy part. It's getting them off completely that's the hard part. We got two of them off completely out of roughly 20 that we started with over a three-month period. All of them show significant reduction in methadone consumption, but interestingly, interestingly, it was the one that interacted most with the assistant that we use for the study, who they come in and have a chat with every day. The ones that got to know the assistant, or the assistant got to know better, had the best chance of methadone reduction, meaning it's the human contact, as well as the the withdrawal relief that you obtain, these were incidentally high THC capsules, 40 milligrams each we were giving them, some of them two, some of them five per day uh, to relieve withdrawal and maintain them off uh, methadone. And this is the case for any other uh, pharmaceutical opiate. You'll, you'll find that when you begin recommending uh, medical cannabis to people using opiates, their opiate consumption will decrease. This has been shown many times in many studies. Uh, I got more death data here, but I won't bother you with that. But uh, opiates kill a significant number of people every year. I think there's been 40 deaths due to fentanyl in Canada already this year. That's illegal and legal use of um, uh, opiates. We're not going to go into this. I go on ad nauseum about this in lectures. It's what we call decarboxylation. It, it's knocking an arm off the THC or the CBD molecule so that it becomes receptor active. I won't bother you with that. Uh, oh, there are endogenous opiates, as there are endogenous cannabinoids, like anandamide and 2-AG. There are uh, endorphins and cephalins and um, uh which bind receptors and, uh, oh, and this is classic receptor signaling, whereas the endocannabinoids, as was described in earlier lectures, have what we call retrograde signaling. So the 
the active ligands are produced at the postsynaptic side travel across the synapse to the presynaptic side where they turn down the tap of neural transmission. When I first started getting into the biochemistry of cannabis, I was amazed that when people take a puff on a joint, they just don't drop dead because there's so much biochemistry happening. But as it turns out, it's all a balancing act, mostly of the CNS. And like I was talking about earlier, homeostasis is, is a part of life and extremely important. And that's what they're doing. They're balancing out your CNS. Because I'm supposed to do two talks in one, I was going to go on to epilepsy without a break. Uh, we've got another hour left. Um, I'm going to cut this short since it's Friday afternoon. I'll make some points about epilepsy and um, then I'll close. Um, this is not relevant. These are the, the two guys that, in my simple mind, these are the fellows that I've met and um, I, I'm very respectful to both of them. Uh, Dr. Raphael Mershulam on the right and Dr. Lou Mirhanush. Um, I was just in my native place and took Dr. Hanush for a tour of Vancouver Island where I was born and he's just an angel of a man and we're, <laughs> I confirm my, my analytical with his lab in Jerusalem. Um, he's an analyst by trade like myself and he's, like I say, he's an angel and he, he, uh, he is always ready to cooperate. Um, but most of my research in the last few years has been focused on cannabidiol that incidentally comes from hemp genetics, not... Okay, there's, there's what we call recreational cannabis. Some people call it marijuana. I really don't like that word. Um, Dr. Jack pointed out why, that it's a, a demonizing word. I much prefer um, cannabis, which is a scientific name. Um, and I can't remember the point I was going to make on that. Anyway, this is some, some uh, data from GW Pharmaceuticals, which is based in the UK, and they've had funding and the ability to grow cannabis for a number of years. And, are way out ahead of most researchers in this field in terms of product development. They have one patented and on the market, first one on the market in Canada called Sativex, which is CBD and THC put back into a formulation where they're almost in equal amounts. And when I run it on the HPLC, I only see those two peaks and virtually nothing else, none of the little peaks that you saw in the earlier chromatogram. And indeed it is natural product CBD and THC in this prep, but they're very highly purified. And when you, again, my simple-minded opinion, but if you highly purify a molecule, you're taking it more toward behaving like a synthetic molecule than a natural molecule with its family. And when you highly purify THC and CBD, you start getting this type of unpredictable effect. Uh, Sativax is used for treating uh, multiple sclerosis and for some pain disorders, but people who use it say, one, it's too expensive, it burns a hole under their tongue, and it doesn't work that well, not as good as smoking a joint. So people will put down their Sativex spray bottle and, and smoke a joint for uh, better relief. And, I mean, God bless these guys for the R&D that they've done, but cannabis medicine is a natural product family of compounds. It's not single molecules. The whole point of what I'm trying to get here today. Um, in the study we've, we've been doing with epilepsy. Right now, I'm pulling together a group from Israel, one from Slovenia, hopefully one from Macedonia. There's one in Spain, one in Canada, 
where when we corral all of these, and they're all children under 20 years old, using cannabis therapeutic for epileptic seizures, we're going to combine that all into one big study and put all that data together so we can make a, a reasonable statement. But the Israelis published a paper in 2015 where they looked at 150 children with epilepsy. They gave them natural hemp flower extract, all standardized, quality controlled. And of the 150 that they started, 86% showed a reduction in their seizures. That's phenomenal. I mean, what other drug would show 86% efficacy for anything? Now, some of these went down 5% in their seizures, some went down 20%, some went down 50%, and some no longer, no longer have seizures. I believe 7% were seizure-free after a week of uh, going on CBD extract. I have witnessed miracles with kids with epilepsy and palsies as well. Uh, with severe palsies, mom and dad will often say, my child is waking up to me, it's paying more attention, it's more alert, uh, more active. And my greatest reward over the years in this business has definitely not been money, because there's been no funding for the research, and I don't make any money from selling cannabis, but. My greatest reward is the pat on the back when mom and dad of a child with epilepsy thank, thanking me for changing their child's life. And um, <laughs> you all know the feeling, but you'll get it a lot by prescribing cannabis. Does anybody ever come and pat you on the back for prescribing Oxycontin? Um, or some of the other pharmaceutical painkillers or anti-epileptics, I get big squeezes from mom and dad. And incidentally, the people collecting the data in these studies are the caretakers, the moms and dads of the children that are actually having the seizures. There was a very interesting study came out of Stanford University in the United States last year. They're using a type of software called REDCap. REDCap was developed by the university in Vermont, and it's data collection software. It's not available on the internet, or you can't buy it. They come in, they plunk it on your server, and then your server goes out to your network. I'm exploring this, this software. I've got my assistants looking into it more, because I think it could be extremely valuable for data collections from large groups of people using the internet. Facebook, Instagram, all the social media that I personally stay away from can gather so much data. What they did in Stanford, they looked at a group of children using natural cannabis and their seizure reduction. Then they compared it to another group using a pharmaceutical seizure reduction, again, a single silver bullet molecule. But they used that comparison as a control. So they were able to put a control behind the moms and dads reporting and their sophisticated statistical interpretation of results in the second study, and the two came out about the same, meaning mom and dad was reporting about the same as the statistical gathering of the data from the other study. They came out on a par, which is uh, support for the well, not only the effects of CBD on, on epilepsy, but uh, for the data itself. So if any of you are uh, epidemiologists or looking to do population studies that seems to be effective using the internet, it's called red cap, like a baseball cap. Uh, you can easily find YouTube videos on it, which are quite interesting. And if you're interested, take my email address at the end and let me know what you think of it, because I'm still uh, working on it, too. Um, I got here, this is from GW Pharma, taken retroactively from persons self-medicating children. The greater than 80% decrease has been my experience with people like Haley, Kyla Pika from Slovenia, and Charlotte, Charlotte's Web from Colorado, became very famous for 
uh, not having seizures after taking hemp flower extract. Haley is a young lady I've worked with in Vancouver for more than 10 years. Kyla is a two-year-old from British Columbia, the province I live in. And Pika was a five-year-old from Slovenia. None of these young ladies have seizures any longer. Um, and this is the side effects that GW, once again a retroactive study, uh, found. And is, this, is this bad? for side effects, is this a bad thing? Uh, and decrease in appetite. My pain relief with high CBD uh, containing trichomes is I'm hungry all the time, and I eat all the time, and I, I lose weight. Um, we, we, this is anecdotal, but we had a fellow who was attending the dispensary who was 120 kilograms he was overweight, he had a big belly. And we put him on a regimen of high THC capsules with some CBD. He came down to 75 kilograms, kept taking the, the capsules, but stopped right at his ideal body weight, which was, you know, bravo. Um, but I, I weigh around 72 kilograms, which is my ideal weight for my height and I continue to take oral uh, cannabidiol, it's a great weight loss uh, herbal remedy. Uh, think of the market in the US for that. Okay, this is chromatography. I'm not gonna bore you too much with it, but this is typical uh, chromatic graphic profile of recreational cannabis. That big peak there is tetrahydrocannabinolic acid, which when you heat it up, turns directly one-to-one -to, -one to THC. Uh, and you'll see that, I don't know which is the best one to look at. Okay. There's a, this is CBD acid and CBD down here. The bigger the peak, the more of the compound there is. This is how we quantify with chromatography, but Notice the difference in the ratio of THC to CBD. It's huge. This is more than 200 to 1. This will give you a psychoactive effect. I call recreational cannabis psychoweed because it can make you psychotic. It can scare the crap out of you. But, um, and you have to limit your dosage. Often by smoking is the best way. It's more difficult to overdose than if you eat an unstandardized brownie and it's too late and you can't turn back and you suffer a THC overdose. Incidentally, in my data banks, I have more than 15,000 cannabinoid profiles from many strains of cannabis. And if I overlay them all, I only see three different ratios of THC to CBD. This is the ratio we see in hemp. This is cannabidiol here. Note the difference between THC acid and the CBD. Here it's more than 200 to 1 CBD to THC. This is the way it's written in the genetics. The hemp, what I call hemp, which is, it's all cannabis. The recreational hemp can breed, crossbreed with the hemp cannabis called hybridization. And, um, It'll change the efficacy of that. It'll change the cannabinoid profile. But you'll never get away from that ratio of high CBD to low THC in hemp or high THC to low CBD in recreational cannabis because it's written in the genetics. The genes that code for the enzymes that tell the, the, the biochemistry to go toward high THC is either turned on or it's turned off. So in the hemp genetics, you always get the high CBD to low THC ratio. And what really bugs me about the law here in Europe and North America is that they only allow 0.2% THC. When, if I overlay those 15,000 chromatograms with the hemp strains, I never see it go over 1%. It can't. It's locked. It can't produce because you've got dumping out up to 20% CBD here, and if you're going to dump out 10 or 20% uh, THC, it's just too much. The plant can't produce that much resin. 
So it, it stops either producing CBD or THC, or if you cross those two, you'll we'll get what I call a 50-50. Here, these peaks are made by UV light absorption, but you'll have to believe me that the area under this, the CBD peak, is equal to the area of the delta-9 THC and the THC acid added together here. When you heat this sample and burn it, or it'll turn into THC, so this peak will go up here to roughly the same height as this. The point is that in what I call the 50-50 strains, again, the enzymes that code for those cannabinoids are turned on or they're turned off, but you'll never get a 70-30, 60-40 ratio of THC to CBD. It, it can't happen. It's written. I, I say it's written in crayon because the first time I put this image, it, it didn't come out dark enough, but the point, this blue trace here is, is overlaid uh, with three other strains. This is the, the THC down here, or sorry, the CBD down here. So this is recreational cannabis, high CBD, or high THC, low CBD. This is hemp, the red, with high CBD, low THC, or the 50-50 profile with THC and CBD in roughly equal amounts. I call it the three-way split. Lumir Hanush, my friend from the Israeli University, said there's actually four ways. You get low THC, low CBD, and a fairly good amount of CBG, the precursor to them both, in a few unique strains may be useful for a placebo, apart from the effect of CBG, but no THC and no CBD in the fourth uh, way that these genetics can go. Um, that's kind of an aside. This is the young lady. I've, she's now 22 years old. I started working with her when she was 14. Has Lennox Gestalt syndrome. Was having 10 to 16 grand mal epileptic seizures per day. Her mother took her to a fellow named Mark Emery, who is a world-renowned activist in cannabis, took her daughter to his, what they call a vape lounge in Vancouver, gave her daughter some vaporized cannabis and immediately noticed a difference in her pre-seizure activity and her mood. Because Mark didn't want a 14-year-old smoking in his club, he sent her up to myself that was in a different dispensary because he knew that I was into standardizing oral preparations of cannabis. When I first met Haley, I had known from the literature that CBD is probably better for epilepsy than THC, but none of the dispensaries' cannabis had any CBD to speak of. It was all recreational weed. Um, Two days later, a hippie kid from Vancouver Island comes into the dispensary, and my job was to analyze the cannabis that he wanted to sell to the club to see how much THC and CBD was in it. But rarely did I see any CBD. But two days after I meet Haley, this kid comes in, puts this bag of cannabis on my table, and he sits and watches while I run it on the HPLC. And as you see, the first peak to come out is cannabidiol, which I, at that time, was rarely seeing. But it, the peak starts to go up and up and up, and I start getting excited because I know I got something I can give this girl. And the kid starts to cry. And at the time, I thought he was crying because he was happy that we had something we could help this girl with. I asked him less than a year ago why he cried that day, and he said, I was just happy I could sell some pot because I was having a really bad day. Um, but nevertheless, this is 10 years ago now. I was part of the group that escorted Haley to her high school graduation when she was 18, which was a great honor. She didn't finish in a normal kind of school, but she did finish high school in a, in a special class. The last time I saw her was just before I left Vancouver in January, and after the meeting I started to cry because she was so cognizant, so aware. Uh, she's reading 
all kinds of you know higher level books now rather than the, the princess and uh, prince sort of stuff. She could do a radio and television interview now. She actually sat with me on the stage in early July when I did a conference in Vancouver. Um, and she wasn't expected to live past 15. And she's one of the miracles that I've witnessed. Again, it's anecdotal. It's one person, one case study. Um, but we see this time and time again with the larger groups of people. Yeah, this is, you're not going to be dealing with people smoking cannabis. You will, but they'll be doing it on their own. They won't be doing it for, from your recommendation. This just illustrates that, for example, if you're treating chronic pain and you smoke cannabis, you get pain relief here, not here, here, not here, here. Throughout your day, you go in a cycle, whereas if you take oral cannabis, you go on to a plateau like for six to four hours of pain relief. So my word is you're better off oral dosing with cannabis, treating chronic pain, seizure disorder, any sort of chronic illness. You're better off oral dosing or using suppositories. Um, this is some recommendations on dosing. Um, in my own little study with taking fairly... Uh, large amounts of CBD to treat the, my pain. I would also co combine it with THC once in a while, either in a smoke form or another capsule. Would I recommend treating, once again, chronic illness, whether it's pain, seizure disorder, or cancer, is you start by, you start the person on CBD dosage. Once again, you start low, work up to around 100, 200 milligrams per day for around a week or 10 days, and then begin the THC dosing. First reason is you get the buffering effect of CBD, so the person's less likely to overdose. Two, you get the synergy of the CBD and the THC for pain relief and inf inflammation. So I recommend any newcomer to cannabis or any person that's used it before, you start them on oral CBD before you begin the THC. And you'll, I expect you'll see good effects with that. Um, and then you want to use different amounts of THC to CBD if you're treating specific things like anxiety, where you would treat with high CBD, low THC. Uh, with anxiety, the person's tolerance to THC is really important. Here's a rule of thumb that I figured out over many years of observing people using cannabis therapeutically. There's a, a genetic difference, once again, to do with the cytochrome P450 enzymes in how people will respond to cannabis. This has not been published, it's observational data, but I've seen it time and time and time again. That the British Celts, the Scots, Irish, and Welsh are three to five times more tolerant to THC than someone from Acadonia, someone from Germany, someone from Holland, than um, the Scandinavian countries, Middle Europe, I call middleweights, and Asians I call lightweights in terms of their tolerance to THC. There's a huge Asian uh, community in Vancouver, but we only had two members out of roughly 500 in our dispensary. They don't respond well to THC, as don't dogs. Dogs respond very well to CBD, but not to THC. They overdose very quickly. Um, point is that if I had a red-haired ha Highlander or a, a Scot come into the dispensary asking for recommendation on what cannabis to use, I'd have less fear in telling him to take 50 to 100 milligrams of THC than I would a person from Macedonia or Croatia or from Middle Europe because, as a rule, you te guys will tend to overdose quicker than a, a burly old Scot. Nothing to do with body weight. THC is psychoactive. It doesn't relate to body weight at all. It relates to your cytochrome P450 enzyme genetics. So how do you guess? My, 
Okay, put it this way. When I, people are asking myself to recommend cannabis to them, my first question is, what part of the world do you come from? Where, what's your genealogy? Where are your parents from? And if they say Germany or, or Middle Europe, I will offer them a lesser dose of THC than if they're of Scottish or uh, Irish heritage. So it's not prejudice, just an observation made time and time again, backed up by the different polymorphic liver enzymes, and um, I can't help it. <laughs> I didn't make up the rules. But it's, you want to make note of that, that there is a genetic uh, difference in the tolerance to THC, and it's nothing to do with body weight. Uh, an overdose on THC can make the anxiety worse. So you want to modulate THC with CBD, and I recommend preconditioning the liver with CBD first. Uh, neurodegenerative orders, a 50-50 extract or strain, we have equal CBD and THC. We find the best. This is not study data, this is just observational up to around 300 milligrams per day of both uh, should treat these types of cis this is schizophrenia you have to be careful um, dr russo presented some data yesterday which will somewhat verify this but high cbd is important for schizophrenia